Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. The four kingdom keys to personal success and prosperity. I'm going to give you four keys in these two sessions that I have applied to my life and I use them every day in order to accomplish personal success and how to experience kingdom prosperity. I'm going to focus on succeeding in times of crisis. How do you become successful when everybody else is crumbling around you? How do you make it through the system when the system has spat you out? What do you do when you are no longer needed by a company? What do you do when you lose your income? What do you do when nothing seems to work out and you're losing your car and your house and, and your sanity? What do you do when there's not enough to take care of your daily obligations? How do you handle the crisis of life when life hits you on the blind side? You didn't expect things to go the way they went. What do you do when even friends abandon you and can't help you? Uh, or when your company has to be shut down or, or when you lose a business? What do you do when there's so much pressing on you from creditors. How do you survive when you've been working on a job for 20, 30 years and then they lay you off? start a new skill what do you do when the insurance company doesn't want to insure you anymore because they are assuming that your age doesn't benefit their policy principles what do you do when sickness ravages your body and the bills of medical attention is eating away at your own family's legacy what do you do when you take your kids out of private school and put them in public school what do you do when you have so much stress in your marriage because of financial problems that it's causing you to have difficult times sleeping with your spouse. Crisis. Let's talk about crisis for a minute. I have a picture up here of a crisis. It's a hurricane. Americans call it a tornado. A hurricane is really a massive tornado. When a hurricane comes, we call it a crisis. Why is a hurricane a crisis? Why is a tornado a crisis? Why is a tsunami a crisis? Why is a snowstorm a crisis? The answer is because a crisis is really circumstances that occur that you have no control over and you didn't cause them. If you lost your job because they laid you off, you can't control that. If your company is not having the kind of customers or the clients have fallen off and you can't make enough money to keep things going, you have to shut it down, that's a crisis. You can't control people coming or not coming to patronize your company. What do you do? Well, a crisis is an institutional circumstances of either nature or the environment or the system that attacks your equilibrium. 
But there are some good things about a crisis. The world is in crisis right now. The economy of all the countries in the world seem to be under great turmoil. And in your nation and in the Bahamas here where I live, there's no different. People are having difficulty making it. But I come with good news today. I want you to follow me very carefully on what to do in the midst of that crisis. There's some things that you can do that are based on the kingdom system that will give you the success and the prosperity that you need in the midst of that crisis. A couple of things about crisis to write down. Number one, crisis is the incubator of creativity. Most of the time, we're not creative until something bad happens to us. When things fall apart, it makes us think outside the box. Secondly, crisis demands a new way of thinking about old problems. An old problem is you got to pay a mortgage. The problem is the source of income that you used to pay it with has been dried up. But the old problem hasn't gone away. You still got to pay a mortgage. So what you got to do is let's find a new way to generate income to pay the old problem. So crisis actually forces you to think about new ways to solving old problems. Thirdly, crisis is an opportunity to improve and advance over old ideas. Sometimes the only way for you to move on is for something to happen to push you. And many times we don't grow until we have to. So crisis comes many times to improve us because we've been stuck in a place too long. And number five, crisis comes also to produce growth. And it also produces a sense of development. It makes you develop new approaches to life. Crisis creates new opportunities. It's amazing when, when we uh, look at the world today, every progressive invention came out of a problem. And that's because crisis makes you develop and think in new ways. Number seven is very important. Crisis produces and manifests true leadership ability. No matter how much you would like to claim to be a leader, only crisis proves it. You are not really a leader in good times. Anybody can lead in good times. Leadership is tested and proven when there is a crisis environment. So crisis comes to test to see if you are as mature as you claim to be. You've been telling people how good God has been. Let's see how good he is when things fall apart. You've been telling me how much faith you got. Well, let's see what kind of faith you have when there has to be situations where things don't look too good and you're not sure how you're going to make it in the morning. In other words, crisis comes to test your leadership ability. Another uh, definition of crisis is that crisis ignites the passion for a renewed vision for your life. Crisis takes you back to what God told you from the beginning. Sometimes you stray away and God got to pull the rug from under you to get you back on the floor. And many times a crisis will take you back to the original idea that God told you from the beginning and it's called your original vision. And this is one of the good things about a crisis. It takes you back to your passion. Now, I want to therefore talk a little bit about the benefits of crisis. There's a statement made by Shakespeare. You all know Shakespeare, the great playwright. Shakespeare said these words. I love it. He says, sweet are the uses of adversity. Say that with me. Sweet are the uses of adversity. That's a deep statement. In other words, he's telling us when things are adverse, when things are in crisis, don't panic. Use them. Use them for the positive result. Everything that happens to you could be used to produce something good. That's amazing. Everything. So Shakespeare caught on to something. He realized in his own thinking that adversity can be used to benefit the one under the adversity. The richest man, one of the richest men in America, his name is John Huntsman. John Huntsman is the founder of one of the largest companies in the United States, and they produce about 90% of all the plastics, forks, and spoons that you use in your house. 
or at your parties. This company is the one, this is like the number one company in the world that produce plastic plates and, and plastic cups. This, this is the company here. It's owned by this man. His company fell into debt and his company actually collapsed some years ago and he went into a crisis mode and he went to the bank. The bank said they ain't loaning no more money and his company went into bankruptcy. He went home and told his wife, I quit. I'm never going to start this company again. I'm going to go find me a job. It's over. His wife said to him, honey, you told me that this idea was given to you by God and that you going to build this and make it successful. You, that's why I married you. I believe you. Now, if you're going to do this, go back and start again. He said his wife made him go back and ask another bank. He left the old bank. And he showed the bank the truth. He said, here's what I did in the last 15 years. Here's what happened. And I could start again. I know how to build a business. Will you trust me? And the bank says, I'll take a chance on you. He had no credibility, no assets, just a record that he built a company. The bank took a chance on him. And he began to start the company again. Today, the company is worth over $14 billion. He ran for the President of the United States during the time of Obama. You remember this man's name. He's one of the candidates for the President of the United States. Billionaire. Here's what he said as a result of his crisis. I quote, if there is a silver lining to bad times, it is this. When facing severe challenges, your mind is normally at its sharpest. End quote. Now look at the statement in that statement he said when you are under the biggest pressure that is when your mind is normally at its sharpest because your mind is having to think of things it never thought of before another quote I got from him is this one he said humans seldom have created anything of lasting value unless they were tried or hurting he was talking from experience he said, we don't produce anything that's worth talking about unless we are under pressure. You know, people respect Bahamas Faith Ministries because we used to be called a cult and we survived that. We used to be called a place where we stole people's money and we survived that. We used to be called a, a kind of a passing in the night phenomenon that won't last and we survived that. In other words, you are never trusted for the things you claim. You are always trusted for the things you survived. It is the test that creates credibility. Write it down. It is the test that creates trust. So if you're going through a bankruptcy moment, that's your test of being trusted on the other side of the crisis. In other words, you never think that a crisis comes to conclude your life. It comes to give credibility to your life. Whatever you are making, through the troubles right now, what you're going through is going to give you the respect of other people observing you. There are people who are praying that you fail and then they'll trust you when you don't. Weird people in the world. They hope you won't make it and when you make it, they congratulate you. So therefore, don't listen to the naysayers. Accept the test as part of you becoming a successful person. Successful people are always survival testimonies. They weren't born successful. Success is a result of going through a furnace, sleeping with lions, being torn apart, being ripped apart, being criticized and attacked. Success is what people think of you after they try to kill you. This is success. Matter of fact, let me just put it this way. Let me define a crisis in detail for you. A crisis is literally a circumstance or an event or a situation affecting you and also affecting your environment over which you have no cause, you didn't cause it, and you also have no direct reason for it being against you and you are victimized by it. You're not responsible for it. If you get fired from your job, that's a crisis. If you were told by a doctor that you got a, a, a cyst in your womb, 
That's a crisis. You didn't cause it. The doctor said you got a, 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 a growth in your, in, your, in your uterus, or you got a growth in your breast, or you got a growth in your brain. That's a crisis. You didn't know it was there. You didn't cause it. If someone says to you, well, you know, uh, uh, we're going to have to withdraw the overdraft from you because, you know, you don't qualify anymore. Well, you tried all these years. Now you're a victim of the system. What do you do? A crisis is simply unplanned and uncontrolled change. A crisis is something you didn't plan on, but it happened. I think that the greatest fear today, the greatest crisis right now in our whole world is the loss of a job. The ability to financially secure yourself. People are afraid of losing their jobs. Some have already done so. As I travel around the world, I've seen thousands of people who literally have lost their homes. I just came back from Orlando and they got rows of million dollar homes with for sale signs in a gated community. I drove through there and I said, my God. They say, yes, people are having to move out because they cannot keep up with the mortgage and the system has collapsed, the bubble has burst, and we got people who had millions of dollars are now sleeping in apartments with two bedrooms. Why? Because the system, unplanned change, a crisis. Sometimes you think you got it bad, but believe me, uh, the, the poor man don't know what they're talking about when they say crisis. A man who is broke don't know what it is to have no money. It's those who have plenty that hurt the worst. The crisis is hitting everybody. That's my point. But write this down, please. This is very important. And that is this. The fear of losing the job is the greatest concern today. And I want to talk about this because that's what the Lord told me to talk about in these two sessions. To check your concept of job. Because that is where the problem lies. Our economic psychology has made us dependent on jobs. And that has become our curse. Because a job is really an opportunity someone else offers you. And if somebody offers you an opportunity, they can always take it back. And if you build your life on someone else's offer, you are as safe as how they feel at the time. And they can change the way they feel anytime and withdraw the offer. Anybody know what I'm talking about? That's why you can't build your life on a job. Stay with me. I'm going to help you with this here. One of the good things about a crisis, if you lost your job, if your business shut down, if you got to withdraw your investments or you had to sell some property or things ain't working out there's a good side to these kinds of things every test is temporary say that with me every test shout it loud give someone a high five tell them every test is temporary i'm gonna say it loud every test is temporary save it some feeling every test is temporary clap your hands that's the truth so no matter what you're facing don't panic too long. <laughs> you may panic for a minute, but I've come to tell you the panicking time is over now because you're going to get some wisdom. Nothing is permanent except God and his promises. Everything else is changing. As a matter of fact, God's promises us that nothing will remain the same. He promised that. Now, God doesn't change. His promise doesn't change. And here's one of his promises. He said in Ezekiel, Ecclesiastes, rather, chapter 3, he says, To everything there is only a season, and to every purpose there is a time under heaven. In other words, everything that you experience is only seasonal. If you broke now, it's only a seasonal brokenness. You're about to move into a lot of income. Tell your neighbor, I'm only passing through a tough moment. Give someone a shout right there. I'm only passing through a tough moment. To everything there is what? A season. You got a bad time in your marriage? Last, outlast it. It's going to come good in a little while. 
In other words, your insane wife can come back to sanity when the season is over. Your husband is temporarily weird. He's going to come back soon. In other words, your kids are acting crazy now, but it's a seasonal insanity. Nothing, Jesus says, is forever. So if your company had to die, he's going to be resurrected. Come on, Mr. Huntsman, talk to me. I'm telling you, if your business failed, I've come to tell you, bury it, have a good funeral, and then get ready for a resurrection. Tell them, I'll be back. Why? Because everything is only for a season. If they fire you, they're going to be sorry later. They're going to try to hire you again when the season change. But you're going to have your own company by then. You can start hiring them. It's a season for everything. Can I hear an amen in the place? Am I talking to myself this morning? To everything. There's a season. So they laid you off, write them a letter. Say, thank you very much for letting me enter a new season. I'll be back. This is one of the most important things I learned. Because we're all running a race. Let me show you something here. It's very important here. Crisis demand new patterns of thinking. That's why they come. As a matter of fact, crisis creates new solutions. When things fall apart, you've got to find another way to solve them. See, the problem with humanity is we are creatures of habit. We have a habit of going to work. And all of a sudden, you ain't got no work, you're still going to work. There are folks who get up, put their clothes on, for God, they got fired. And they drive past the place, up and down, you know, just looking at the place. Hey, you are fired, okay? Break the pattern. We got a pattern of being broke. So we even get money, we spend it just to make sure we are broke. It's a pattern. But crisis comes to break the pattern. Write this down. Crisis initiates new concepts. It also renews our vision. It cancels experience. This one is important. When a crisis comes, your experience becomes useless. This is why the most silent voices today are the economists. They are saying nothing right now. For the last five years, the economists have said nothing. They've made no recommendations. You know why? Every principle they ever taught them in school has been canceled. The economy that is now existing never existed before. They never saw a country become bankrupt. They never saw a failed government before. What do you do when nothing you learned is working? A crisis comes to cancel that. And that, this is why I think, you know, I, I've been taught, like many of you, my parents were so nice. They said, children, go to school, get an education. And then they would say, experience is the best teacher. Well, that's not always true. Experience can be your worst enemy. Because if you got experience in doing something a certain way, and the environment changed, your experience becomes your enemy. Well, I never had to do this certain job before. Yeah, but you broke now. You better learn to do it. <laughs> well, I got a lot of experience in banking. Yeah, but ain't no bank hiring right now. You got to go work in the hotel. I got an experience in, in hotel. Yeah, but hotels ain't hiring. You better go learn to be a gardener. Come on, don't look at me that way. See, your experience is destroyed by crisis. Sometimes we become so hooked on our experience, we wait until we find something that can use our experience and nothing wants your experience. You have to almost retool yourself sometimes. You gotta relearn things, you gotta, you gotta learn new skills, why? Because life has a way of shaking things loose. There are people right now who are so proud they are starving. I can't get that job, that's below me. Oh yeah? You, you better get that job. Take that job that's available. We're gonna soon bury you below the ground if you don't get your act together and put your pride in your pocket. If a job opens up, tell them, I'm gonna take it for a season. Yeah. Clap, man, some of y'all get, get your head right. See, Jesus, was temporarily a carpenter. He always knew he was the savior of the world, but for that period of time, he had to work in a job, but that wasn't his work. 
Sometimes you got to take a job so you can survive and yeah. take and work on your work. This is no season for you to have your pride to the point where you're starving your children. Dressing up and ain't going nowhere. Driving on a car on E, trying to pretend everything's cool, and then bumming money from people. You better go get yourself a job until you get your work back. Oh boy, it's getting quiet. Some of y'all ain't clapping, but that's all right. <laughs> Crisis manifest and express if you are a true leader and true leaders will do anything like be a carpenter until it's time to become the savior your job doesn't define you you are bigger than the job you get so enjoy it why you are passing through that job you ain't going to that job that's not your destiny that's a temporary location for you to learn some things and they pay you to learn while you're on your way to greatness this is why you should never despise a job crisis demands innovative thinking makes you think in ways you never thought before young people coming out of college looking for a job some of you have tried to stay in the US they broke you come back home, we broke. What are you going to do? Become innovative. This is very important. I want to show you something here. I want to talk about success. This is how we need to fix our definitions here. Please write down every statement. Everyone wants to be successful. I've never met anybody who planned to fail. Every human wants to be successful, everybody. But I want to make it clear, success is predictable. Isn't that a weird statement? But you can predict success. Secondly, failure is also predictable. This is very, very important what I'm saying right now. There's no luck in success. That's why you can't be successful playing the lottery. Success is what? Predictable. So is failure. Now, how can be these two important things be predictable? Here's why. Because everything in life was designed to function by laws. And laws make everything predictable. Hmm. Let me give you an example. Your car was built to operate on the law of unleaded gasoline. That's a law built into the car. If you were to put grade A Florida orange juice, expensive orange juice in your car, it's tank, what have you done? Broken the law. If you put five gallons of orange juice in your gas tank, can I prophesy that you will not have a car functioning? Can I? Can I predict then? How can I predict it? What, did I, what, what happened? You violated the law. So success and failure are not mysterious. They are both results of law. At least the point number six. God designed your life to be successful. He designed it to be successful. I'm going to show you in a minute why. Everything God created, he designed it to be successful. Everything. The roach, the rat, the seed, the fish, the birds. Everything God created. The atom, the maggot. Everything God created. He designed it to be successful and there's a reason why at least the point number seven your success is good for God say that with me my success is good for God say it again this is very very important when I discovered this I was a teenager 
This is one of the things that changed my life. I discovered this reading the Bible myself as a 17-year-old teenager. I discovered that God needs me to succeed. Let me explain why. Write this down. The success of a product protects the reputation of the manufacturer. I'm going to say it again. The success of a product does what? Protects the reputation or the name of the manufacturer. When I discovered that principle, I put pressure on God. You see, a product carries with it the entire credibility of the manufacturer. Everything created by a manufacturer, before it leaves the factory, the last thing they put on it is their name. You got an iPad, you see Apple on it. Apple is the name of the company that produced this. Your shoe has the name of the company. Your blouse, your shirt has the name of the company. The pen in your hand has the name of a company. Every product carries the company's name. Write the word name down, please. I want to tell you what the word name in Hebrew means, name. It means being, B-E-I-N-G. Being. Strange. In other words, in Hebrew, the name of a thing is the thing. This is why when Moses asked God, what is your name? It was a problem for God to answer. <laughs> Moses spoke in Hebrew. We don't know what kind of Hebrew it was, so don't try to speak Hebrew. Even Hebrew today in Israel is not the original Hebrew. Folks getting excited about these names of God and things. Listen, get settled down, okay? Even the name you got, Yahweh, ain't a real name. But anyhow, you settle down. Listen. He asked God, what is your name? God told Moses, well, I am what I am. That's what I am. God answered correctly. A name is not a label in Hebrew. Name is character. So God said to Moses, my name is, I am, whatever I am at the time. That's the way it's written. In, you know, if you translate it into English, it doesn't make sense. My name is whatever I am at the time. Call me that. What is your name? God says, it depends. It depends on what I am at the time. So Moses decided to write God's name the best he could. He wrote Yehovah blank. It's a blank. And you fill in the blank depending on what God becomes. For example, God doesn't heal people. He is Rafa. Yeah, I'm trying to talk. God doesn't bring peace. He is Jehovah Shalom. God doesn't provide things for you. He is Jehovah Jireh. God doesn't give you wisdom. He is Jehovah Nisi. Are you getting this? So when you start saying you want to know the names of God, that's impossible. Because God becomes whatever you need him to be at the time. If you're sick, you don't need money. You need Rafa. So if you need healing, he becomes Jehovah 
right for the you, but the guy right next to you needs some money. He becomes Jehovah Jireh to that guy. So you got two manifestations of God's character in the same place. That same God became flesh and dwelt among us in a body called Yeshua, which means Joshua, which simply means Savior. And one time they asked him, what is your name? Who are you? His answer was, I've been telling you all along who I am, but you don't believe me. They said, no, you confuse us. Because on Monday you say, I am the light. And then on Tuesday you say, I am the way. And on Wednesday you say, I am the bread. And on Thursday you say, I am the water. He said, which one are you? It depends on what you need, he says. <laughs> Jesus became everything you need depending on what you need. So he says, I am, and he put in the blank, the light of the world. I am the water of life. I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the way. I am the door. In other words, what do you need me to become? I become that. Name is being. I'm getting at something here. So when you put your name on something, you're putting your being on it. The word in the Hebrew for name is the same word for image. Write it down. Image is name. For example, Calvin Klein is an image. Hmm? Sean John is an image. You wear a person's image. When God was in his factory producing you, the Bible says he said to himself, or three of himself, <laughs> Father, Word, Spirit. He says, let us produce a product. This ain't going to be like the birds and ain't going to be like the dogs and the cats and the fish. This is going to be a unique product. We can put our name on this one. Let us make a species called man in our own image. That word is powerful. It means characteristics. We will put our stamp, our image on this creature. No angel was made in the image of God. When Michael sees you, he sees the very image, the character, the being of God. When Gabriel sees you, he sees the very character, the being of God. Let us make man in our own image and likeness means he functions like us now why does God make you not just to have his characteristic but also to function like him because God never fails So God said, I can't afford for you to fail because I got my name on you. I'm about to show it right here all by myself. Uh, I know you're using this. Let me borrow this for a second. These are, these are the cyber saints. I have in my hand a iPad. From the company called Apple. Now, when you bought this, it was in a box, sealed, film wrapped around it. When you open it, the first thing you saw was not the product. They had it covered up with a, a book. And the book says, 
Do not attempt to operate this product until you read me completely. How many of you read it completely? Let me see your hands. Don't tell lies in church. All right. See, no one reads that book completely. No one does. Forgive me too, Lord. All right. But if, if I want you to go back home and check the book. Because in the book, usually in the two last pages, you'll find something important. Every manual. First, it has a warranty page. Then it has a guarantee page. Am I right? You don't read them. Okay. These are very important, the most important pages in the whole document. The warranty and the guarantee is the manufacturer's promise that if anything doesn't work in this product, they will replace it free of charge at their expense. They say, put it back in the box, ship it to us at our expense, we will pay the mailing, we'll ship you a new one back. They don't even know you. So don't think they like you. They ain't doing it because they like you. There must be some other motivation why they're so committed. Then they say, okay, if something goes wrong with this, in the first two years, we will replace everything free. We will send our authorized dealer to repair whatever is wrong and we will pay for it. They don't even know you. They said, if you open this up and there's any malfunction in this, we guarantee with a warranty by our company that we will make sure you get a brand new one replacement at no cost to you. They don't even know you. So why are they so dedicated to this? I'm going to say it slow. Why are they so dedicated to this? I didn't say to you. They don't know you. They are dedicated to their product because when you turn it over, their name is on the product. They don't know your name. They will pay any monies. They take their entire company and back up the product. They promise to send you an authorized dealer. They promise to send you genuine parts. And they even warn you, do not attempt to fix it yourself. Take a deep breath. That's a deep statement. In other words, no product should try to fix itself and no customer should try to fix another man's product. Why? Because the company is only interested in its name. So it wants its success to be tied to its name. The company knows that if anything fails in this product, their entire name, their reputation, their character is in trouble. So they will do anything. They say, ship it back to Canada. We'll pay. Why would they do that? Because success of the product is more important than the cost they have to pay. To restore the product, there's no expense spared. Why? Name. Image. You ever heard this? A company had a bad image. God says, let's put our name on this one. And then God says, now we are going to give this product a manual. The manual is simply the laws laid down by the manufacturer that ought to be followed to protect the product 
and to guarantee function. Laws are never to destroy a product. Laws are given to what? Protect the product. Why do we hate laws so much? We don't understand their purpose. They are to guarantee function. I can never be a failure in life anymore. Why? I know how to succeed. Why? I learned some laws. And that's why you're going to miss none of these sessions this week. Because you have to learn that coming out of a crisis is 100% law-based. Laws have no crisis. Gravity have no idea what's happening in your economy. Let me say it slow. Gravity doesn't care about the economy. You jump off a roof, bad economy, good economy, no economy, gravity gonna pull you down. Get my point? In other words, laws don't respect laws of a government on earth. <laughs> For example, God made your rectum with a law. It's an exit excretion point. That's a law, that's a biological law. Don't look at me. That's a biological, scientifically sound law. My hip is an exit. No legislation in any government can turn that into an entrance. The laws doesn't change the law. I just thought I'd throw that in in case some of y'all get a little excited about some things. Nature has no respect for any parliament. You can't vote to change nature's natural laws. Mm -mm. And God has built into his systems, including you, laws in the product that guarantees its function to protect his name. That's why when you failed in Genesis 3, the manufacturer said, if I have to go down there by myself and die myself and spill my own blood, I will spare no expense to restore my product. Why? God didn't save you for him. I'm sorry for you. Let me try it again. God didn't salvage you for your sake. All this stuff God is doing ain't for you. You think God blessing you? God ain't blessing you. He protecting his name. Listen, God is going to bring you out this week or whatever you have to face. Not because of you. I want you to get that, put it in your face and say, Lord, deliver me for your name's sake. Come on, say it like you believe it for the first time in your life. I don't know what you're facing this week, but tell God, don't do it for my sake. Do it for your own reputation. Put some pressure on him. Your success is good for God. If you fail, you embarrass the company. That's why he died on the cross. To protect his own name. That's why he rose again. To protect his own name. That's why he gave you the Holy Spirit. To protect his own name. That's why he lives with you every day through the Holy Spirit. Protect his name. That's why he wants you to follow his laws. Protect his own name. That's why he wants you to be righteous. To protect his own name. Because his name is on the line when you fail. Your success is good for God. Write this point down please. Very important here. Success is not a pursuit. You remember I started by saying everybody wants to be successful. The problem is you are pursuing it. 
Successful people never try to be successful. <laughs> if you try to pursue success, it runs from you. Success is a result of obedience to laws. A car doesn't try to run well. Just give it what it needs. That's all. And it runs well. You don't have to try to get your car to run well. It's not a pursuit. Just follow the laws of the engine. And it runs well. So it is with life. You trying to be great, you'll never be great. You're trying to be successful, you'll never be successful. You're trying to be prosperous, it'll run from you. The Bible actually says, he who chases money, money takes wings. That's in the Bible. The more you run after it, the more it runs from you. Why? It doesn't happen that way. As a matter of fact, Jesus said something that is so weird. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteous laws and all of these things shall what? Be added unto you. They'll be chasing you. You attract things. I got a phone call this week from the, one of the, the chairman of the board of the NFL. This is the board. And the guy called me five times trying to get me. I called him back. I said, yes, sir. He said, uh, I've been trying to get you for a while. I said, yes, sir. He said, look, uh, we are having some problems with NFL players. Uh, uh, they're having difficulties. And he talked about how their marriages are breaking up and how they're having difficulties in all these different areas. And, and he says, uh, you the man that we want to come in and talk to the NFL players. That happened two days ago. And I'm saying, I said, me? He said, yes. He said, we've, we have, we've read some of your material. We want to retain you as a consultant. He said, we're also going to write a book for NFL players for transitioning out of sports into natural, normal life. He said, we want to do at least three chapters in the book. We'll talk about royalties later. I said, yes, sir. Now, here's my point. Here's my point. I am still a Bain Town boy, living in an island seven miles wide. I didn't move to the U.S. to try and get a better job. It came looking for me from the highest level, and I wasn't even looking for it. All I'm doing is obeying the laws of God, obeying the laws of God, obeying the laws of God. And these things are added. Success is a result of what? Obedience, Obedience to laws. I want you to learn that this week. Coming out of a crisis is a law issue. You know, my pilots flew me in this morning. And I, I appreciate Captain Thurston. You know, he, he teaches me so much. He said, Pastor Miles, when you get into a storm in an aircraft, he says, you go back to basics. You don't try to, to correct things in the aircraft. You go back to basics and get back to the laws of flying. He's just obeyed the laws and the plane gets itself out of the storm itself. Are you in a crisis? Don't panic. Go back to laws. Like tithing. Okay, God, I'm broke. Let me tithe. I got some orange. Let me give two oranges away. Why? Let me go back to basics. We become so sophisticated. You know, I got to try and work this out. I got to try and calculate what's going to happen. God says, look, just go back to basics. Bake a cake for someone and give it to them. A law. I want to show you this. I want to define success for you. First of all, let me tell you what success is not. Write this down. Success is not what you've done compared to what others have done. You'll always find someone dumber than you. You'll always find someone who can't run as fast as you. So don't try to compare yourself to anybody. You'll always have success against somebody else. So success is not what you've done compared to what I have done. That's not success, that's competition. 
So what is success? Success is what you've done compared to what you were created to do. How do you measure success? By what you've done compared to what you're being created to do. For example, if a bird that was created to fly never flies, that bird is a failure. But if that bird created to fly flies, it is successful. So success is first of all discovering what you're supposed to be doing. What you were born to do. What you were created to do. What is your gifting? And then forgetting competition and pursuing fulfilling that gift. That's success. And you do all in your might to keep pursuing fulfilling the gift. Don't worry about success. Serve the gift. You know those four Bahamian boys who ran in the Olympics recently? You all only saw them on TV. You haven't seen their training habits, their eating habits. The oldest one among them tried to win a goal many times and failed, but he kept coming back. How about you coming back? That don't just happen. Do you know why we all love a winner? Because deep in our DNA, in the heart of our spirit being, is the spirit of a creature that knows how to succeed. And when we see it, it makes us identify with it. That's why we don't like to see people who come last. The good news is, you are here because you won. <laughs> Do you know that when your mother and father went to bed, over 500 million sperms were released by your father? Scientifically proven. Average 500 million. And they all dashed toward one egg in the woman. It was your mother. And those sperms were fighting to get there first. And guess who made it? You did. That means 499 million sperms lost the race because you won. You are here because you won. You're not here trying to win. Give yourself a hand, you winner, you. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, I made it. I beat them all. I won the race. I begin as a runner. And I begin as a winner. Give God a hand for winning before you even start the race, huh? That's why you're here. Now you're here, you gotta find out why did I come? That's where the success part is. And I gotta figure out what, I, what is my gift? What is my assignment? What is my reason, my purpose for being here? Don't miss Wednesday night. We're gonna talk about that. How to find it? Because that's success. Success is not in your job. Make a note of this, please. Success is the fulfillment of the purpose and the assignment for which you were created. A seed is only successful when it becomes a fruit-bearing tree. You know, if a seed becomes a tree, it's still not successful. It must bear fruit. And the fruit must have seed in it. A successful seed. In other words, if you only do half of your life, you're still not successful. If you only do some of what you're supposed to do, you're still not successful. We're supposed to die like the Apostle Paul. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I am like a, he says, I am like a, a drink offering. I've been poured out, he says. There's nothing left. That's success. Success is dying empty. Success is saying, I have done everything that I was set here to do. That's success. Please, friends, listen to me. Success is simply fulfillment and completion of your purpose. The purpose of a fish is to swim in the ocean 
and become one of the systems that actually cleanse the ocean. That fish swims. It has to swim to be successful. It's successful if it swims. That's why God made sure it could swim. Because he got to protect his name. He made the fish to swim, so the fish better swim. So he gave the fish the ability to swim so that he could be successful. Ooh. Whatever you were born to do, he built into you the ability to do it for his name's sake. I come with good news this week. Your future is in the gift that he gave you. You know why we call it a gift? You didn't have to work for it. You, it came with the product. You know, when you look at this iPad, thank you, Pastor Pat, for a second. This iPad got all kinds of stuff in it. It came with it. It came with everything needed to be an iPad. You ain't got to pray for nothing to be added to this. No fasting and prayer. It comes with it. When you came to this earth, you landed, boom. You came with everything necessary to fulfill your assignment. That's why going to university doesn't make you successful. You don't go to a school to get your gift. Education cannot give you a gift. It refines your gift, but it can't give it to you. Your gift was built in by the manufacturer. That's why your gift must not be a victim of the economy. Crisis cannot destroy a gift. Crisis manifests gifts. Most gifts are buried on a career. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Most gifts are stuck in a job that you had for 40 years, buried in the graveyard of your career. That's why God fired you. To get your gift to be resurrected. So you can start thinking about something else. Sometimes your job is your greatest enemy because it becomes the graveyard of your work. The problem with the Caribbean people is we've been built to be employed by government. This is one of the greatest curses upon our historical mentality. We look to the politician for our future. <laughs> Ooh. Excuse me. See, God never gave Adam a table. Never gave Adam a chair. <laughs> Never cooked a single meal for Adam. God hid the chair in the tree. Gave the man the tree. He said, work with that. I give you a brain with 500 billion cells. Use them, please. Stop looking at the government to bring you everything. Oh. This is why the curse of our region is consumerism. We consume, we don't produce. Producers are thinkers. Consumers are hoarders. That's why we import 90% of what we consume. We don't produce nothing. Why? We are built to depend on the system to provide us employment. Maybe that's why the system ain't working. Maybe that's why the system is spit you out, spat you out. Because the system is saying, go think. Start up something on the inside. Let me show you something. Joshua. God said, Joshua, keep this law book on your lips. Joshua was a young guy, just like you, wanted to do something good in life. 
God says, here's the secret. Keep this book of the law on your lips. Meditate on it day and night. He says, and be careful to do everything written in it. And then he says, the result is this. You will make your way prosperous. And you will have good success. The two things you're trying to get are related to law. You think it's related to, the, related to work, hard work? And, no, 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 no. You can work hard and still be broke. Ask the person next to you. Don't look right, don't look right now. <laughs> it ain't hard work that does it. <laughs> slaves work hard. Study history. Slaves are hardworking people. They don't even own themselves. So working hard is not the secret. His laws. If you keep my laws, meditate, talk about them on, the on your lips. He says, they will what? You will make your way prosperous. That means you make your own prosperity. Yes. By what? Doing the laws. I want you to forget about people talking about crisis anymore. Laws have no crisis. I'm going to teach you some laws this week to help you understand you can come out of anything. Sitting home in that house, you are not activating some laws that can make you prosperous. Right in your own house. You got an oven that don't work except once a week. That's a sin. You only use your car to go to work. Something wrong with that. You could serve some people with your car. Pick an old lady up from the jerry I to take out every week, once a week. Use your car. It's, there's a law. He says, you will make your way prosperous. You have good success. Look at Jeremiah. God says, 29 verse 11. I know the plans I have for you, God says. Plans to prosper you. What kind of God is this? Now, why does he want you to prosper? Namesake. I plan for my product to prosper, he says. What else? Not to harm you. Why? Because my name is on you. I can't have a broken product. That's, that's bad for my reputation as a company. You know how I pray when I have a need? I say, Lord, this ain't good for you. I can tell everybody. <laughs> and the needs keep being met. You don't pray for your sake. I have a plan, he says, for you. A plan to prosper you, not to harm you. A plan to give you what? Hope. And I got to make sure you make it to the destiny. What's the destiny? The destiny of a bird is to fly. I got to make sure you make it to flight. The destiny of a seed is to become a tree with fruit. I got to make sure you make it to the fruit bearing stage. I have to make sure you make it to your end because my name is on the line. I've come to tell you in announcement today with my whole spirit that God is going to make you successful for his name's sake. Before we go, just lift your hands and thank him for a couple of seconds. Just thank him for what he's about to do to bring you out for his name's sake. Just thank him for it for a minute. I know the plans I have for you, he says. Plans to prosper you. Plans not to harm you, but to give you hope. Hope is coming today. Hope, you coming out? Hope, 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 hope. He's saying, I'm coming out because of my name's sake. 
I'm going to fix this because of my reputation. I'm going to bring you out because of my name's sake. Give him some praise right here. I'm going to give you hope. Hope. I am hopeful because my future is inevitable. I will succeed because it's good for God. Look at this next verse, Ecclesiastes 10. It says, if the axe is dull and its edge is unsharpened, then much strength is needed. You ever try to cut a tree down with a dull axe? The tree never gets hurt. Who gets hurt? You. Who works hard? You. Do you succeed? No. So working hard don't succeed? A dull axe is hard work and the tree laughing at you and all the callus building up in your hands, blood begin to form in your palms and the tree is saying, what are you doing? If the axe is dull, much strength is needed. But I like the next statement. But with skill, ha, ah, success comes quickly. But with what? Skill. I looked at the word skill, the Hebrew word. It means knowledge of laws. A skillful person is not a person who got a PhD. A skillful person is a person who knows the laws. Your car stops running on the highway. You pull over on the side, you try to start it, and the car just makes a click. What do you do? First you suck your teeth. That's Bahamian's first reaction. And then you begin to talk to the car. Some very interesting statements. This old dumb stupid car. See, he knows exactly what he's gonna say. This crazy car. Why this car is so stupid? Always stopping at the wrong time. And you get into this whole argument. Third step, you walk out the car. You look at it. Then you kick it. Dumb, stupid car. So now you turn violent against the car. The car sitting there going, why are you talking to me? Why are you cussing at me? Why are you beating me up? I ain't done you nothing. You blaming me for your ignorance as to what's wrong with me. You don't know the laws by which I function, that's all. And because you don't know the laws by which I function, you're attacking me. And so somehow, some thought in your brain says, pick up your telephone, your cell phone, and call the mechanic. You call the mechanic, the mechanic arrives in 10 minutes, he shows up, he was the problem. And you say, I don't know, this old dumb car wouldn't start. Mechanic, okay, no, no problem, go, 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 and go sit down in the car. Turn the key, click. He said, turn it again, click. He said, okay, I know it's wrong. He opens the hood, goes under there for about two minutes. He said, tie it again. <clears throat> he said, done. Now you were there for two hours cussing. Two minutes, he's finished. What's the difference between, <laughs> I ain't get to the money yet. What's the difference between two hours and two minutes? Knowledge of skill. I've been working so hard trying to get my life right. Working so hard trying to get my life right. Trying to work so hard to make it. I've been working so hard to make it. God said, look, you, you're kicking life. You're cussing at life. You need skill. Look at that verse again. If the axe is dull, that means you dull. You don't know how to fix this car. You dull. The guy with the skill walks up and he even can hear what's wrong. When you got laws, you can even smell what ain't going to work. Success is not luck. You got to make sure you keep obeying laws. When I counsel people, I would tell them, look, uh, you violated the law. And they like, look, you know, okay, listen, you want this marriage to work? You got to, there's some laws. There ain't no magic. I can't pray for you to have a good marriage. There's some laws involved in this. Ain't no devil in this. Right. Your marriage got law problems. I was blaming the devil for things. Laws. 
if the axe is what? Dull. Much strength is needed with no success. But with skill. Success comes how? Even quickly. The guy said, two minutes, finish. Now the problem is when he's finished. <coughs> See, you want prosper, okay? Prosperity come from what? Laws. The guy brought some laws to the car. Now he gonna prosper. And you ain't gonna prosper. You losing. If you didn't know the laws of a car yourself, he wouldn't get your money. So you'll be prospering yourself. You take your money to a dentist because you can't fix your teeth. You take your money to the doctor because you can't fix your body. You take your money to the lawyer because you can't understand the contract. In other words, when a person develops their skill, you take their money to them. It's a law. So why would the NFL call me? They saw a skill. And believe me, your skill is developed for a long time without pay. Just keep working on it. Just keep working. Sometimes you got to work with the children first, you know. Some of you want to be big right away. No, go work in children's church first. Just work on it. I learned to teach by talking to kids who didn't know when I messed up. Let me say it again. You want to be a public speaker? Go teach in children's church. The kids don't know when you don't do right. <laughs> Go work in the nursery. Talk to them babies. Tell them about God. They don't know if you're messing up. Practice your gift at every opportunity. Stop looking for a check. Look for an opportunity. Work your gift. Work your gift. So he says, if the axe is dull, the edge is unsharpened, you got to work hard and get nothing done. But with laws, skill makes it successful. Let me give you this last one before we go. Write this down, please. Luke, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God, and these things will be what? Given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Luke 4, 42, he says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also because that is why I was sent. I'm setting you up for something here. He tell us, he's giving us this kingdom, this country. Now, here's what's unique about it. Matthew, he says, the knowledge of the secrets of this kingdom has been given to you. Knowledge of what? Of the secrets. Write, that, write the word secrets down. He says there are some secret laws that you're supposed to learn when you come into this kingdom lifestyle. He says, it's not given to those outside. Which means that somebody could be right next to you, losing their job, losing their business, losing all their life, and you right next to them, you gaining all kind of prosperity, gaining your life, gaining your business. Now, why, how come yours working and mine ain't working? The difference is there's some secrets. He call them secrets. Another verse that makes me interesting, he says, I will give you the keys, plural, of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you unlock on earth will be unlocked in heaven. Whatever you lock up will be locked up in heaven. You got some keys? Loan me your keys. Anyone got some keys handy? All right. This guy just gave me a bunch of keys. Don't forget, okay? What am I going to show you? I got a bunch of keys. I can walk around all day saying, I got some keys. I got some keys. The trouble is, I don't know what they're for. Keys have secrets. I will give you the secrets. I'm going to give you the keys, plural, of the kingdom. Keys are laws. This is a law to a certain place. Suppose this key is to a safety deposit box with $2 million in it. But I don't know that. I got some keys. I broke, you know. I got some keys. Side of the road. I got some keys. 
under the bridge. I got some keys, $2 million. And I'm sleeping on a piece of cardboard with keys. Hold your Bible up. Say, I got some keys. That's a bunch of keys you got in your hand right now. The book is full of the keys. But you're under the bridge. That's why we're going to talk about it this, this week. You have to learn, what is the secret to the keys? The only person that knows the secret to these keys is the one who owns the keys. <laughs> Check this out. Keys are laws. Write this down. Keys are what? Laws. The word for keys in scripture is the same word as principles. Laws, precepts, schemes. These are principles, schemes. I have a car and I'm still walking because I don't know which car the key opens. I can be in the sea of cars and still be walking because the key's got a secret. I don't know the laws. Write this down. Laws are universal. That means they work anywhere. Number two, laws are permanent. Gravity is always present in any country. Fire burns in England. It also burns in China. And it burns in Calabash Bay. China and England and fire don't have different fires. It's a law. Heat burns. My point is, if you learn the keys, it doesn't matter where you live. I told you, I don't need to leave the Bahamas to be successful. Success comes looking for you in the Bahamas. If you work the laws. Number three, principles and laws work anywhere. That means in a crisis, outside a crisis, under a crisis, behind a crisis, it works. Once you get the laws. Number four, principles and laws are not partial. They no respect a person. Stop saying my pastor Miles had a break. I had no break. I grew up with roaches and rats, man. But I learned the laws as a teenager. When you were shooting marble, I was reading the Bible. That's all. We use that time differently. You've been smoking dope. I've been smoking the word. You high, I higher. It's, it's, it's as simple as that. How do you lose? How do you use your time? Don't get jealous of a guy who learned the keys early. That's why I'm here standing here to teach you the keys. You got to learn the keys so you can turn your life around and make your way prosperous. Stop waiting for the economy to turn around. We're going to learn in this week how to turn the economy around in your own life. Ain't no lack of money in the world. Ain't nothing went to the moon. Not a dollar left this planet. Everything is still here. But they, the wealth follows laws. It doesn't follow wishes. Money coming. Money ain't coming. It. You, you, you got to play. You got to work some laws. Laws are not partial. God don't like Chinese people or white people or yellow people or black people or you red. God, it ain't partial. Gravity will kill anybody. Am I right? Fire will burn any color skin. Laws are not partial. Number five. Principles and laws guarantee success and result. They guarantee them. Which means that you can actually control what happens from here on out. I'm going to show you that on Wednesday night. I'm going to give you a key that you'll never forget. You're going to come out of this situation. We ain't going to wait for no government policy. We got our own government policy. Our government policies never change. They work every time. Number six, principles and laws can never be broken. You cannot break guarantee. 
uh, uh, gravity rather. You can't say gravity, I'm going to jump in the 10th story building, I rebuke you in Jesus name, you will not work. <laughs> gravity say thank you very much, I'll kill you while you're rebuking me. You don't break laws and expect success. That's the point I'm making. You don't break laws, they break you. Let me tell you something friends. What makes a good counselor is someone who knows laws. All this psychology stuff you're getting into, listen, the psychology of being divorced four times, you get an advice from for marriage? <laughs> I did some Freudian studies when I was in university, you know, for Freudian theories, all this deep stuff. I'm like, okay, this is interesting. Yeah, but now what about the laws, the natural laws of God? Laws. You, you, you don't break laws and win. But Pastor Miles, I still don't do this. No problem. I'm going to see you on the other side of your problem. But this is just how I feel. Okay. You violate a law. Is there any, any, see, laws don't take nothing personal. So if I give you advice, it ain't going to be what I think. You know. I always go into law. I can say, okay, this is the law. This is the law of God. I, I never give personal counsel. You come to me for help, I give you laws. Car on the gas, gasoline. You need no prayer, no fasting, no tongues. Go to the gas station. Simple. You ain't got to get spiritual on this, whatever. I give you a law. Law say you need gasoline, go to gasoline. Some people are so spooky. And some of you are probably, yeah, you trust the Lord. That means I say the Lord. The poison violate the law. You tell them go correct it. Let me say one more thing to you while I'm at it. Here's a key. If I go to a door and try to open the door with this key and I start speaking in tongues and praying in tongues and reading the Bible and quoting Dr. Monroe's books and you know, yeah, 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 yeah. The door still locked, eh? Then I get reading, hey, oh, I repent that. No matter how emotional you get, door still locked. God don't answer prayer because you pray loud, scream, speak in tongues, or roll on the floor. You got to come with keys. Your emotions don't bless you. You have emotions after the blessing come. Hey, I got it. That's when you don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't stand by the door saying, open. The door say, no. <laughs> I need a key. And the right key too. Don't just come with any key. It's a law. You can't use you know, the wrong law to try to get something right. Hmm? You say, man, you know, I can marry him even though he ain't a Christian. And I can get him saved. All right. But just don't come to me for advice. I love him. Yeah, you love him. <laughs> you love the locked door too. I love this door. Do I say still need the right key? Laws. Look at number seven. Principles and laws have inherent judgment. Remember I told you that success is predictable, but I also said failure is predictable also? Yeah. If you stay on the roof, you don't got to worry about gravity. Jump off the roof, gravity does its job. Now, if you jump from a four-story building, did God kill you? Did the devil kill you? Who killed you? A law killed you. The judgment is built in to the law. So when you violate a law, failure is not a gift of the devil nor of God. It's a result of violation. So you can't blame anyone for your failure in life. And the only way to correct failure is to go back and retract yourself. I said, let me get back and obey laws. A lady came to me, she was a Seventh-day Adventist, you know, she was telling me one day, she said, y'all don't worship on the right day. I said, okay. I said, well, you know, praise the Lord. 
And she's working with me in the Ministry of Education. She was real adamant. And every day she'd come to me, you know you are. You're going to hell. I said, all right. Y'all worship on Sundays, okay. But the worship on Saturday, all right. Two months later, she came to me. Can I see you? I said, sure. She sat down. She started crying. I said, what happened? She said, I'm pregnant, and I ain't married. So I asked her, what were you doing on the Sabbath? <laughs> no, not really. You know, people are amazing. Trying to keep a law, breaking another one, and expect to succeed. So she said, she said, what am I going to do? I haven't told my parents yet. I don't know. My whole life is destroyed. Young girl, nice, beautiful girl. I said, oh, well. I said, tell you one thing. Uh, you know, we got to deal with your parents. I'll be happy to meet with them and talk to them for you, and we can get this sorted out with them. Uh, she said, you know, uh, I don't know what to do with the baby. I said, well, you can't kill the baby. No, that's, the baby's innocent. The baby didn't do anything. That baby is pure. You're the one that messed up. And I said, uh, what you are experiencing is the harvest. <laughs> Anybody get my point? Yeah. Law's got it built in. Have sex, we'll have baby. She said, can you pray for it to go away? I said, no. <laughs> Whatsoever, man, sow it. Some of you are reaping right now stuff you wish you didn't plant. That's the way life is. You don't break laws, they break you. You don't violate them, they violate you. The judgment, God doesn't even judge you. The law judges you. It's built into the law. If you want to be successful in your life and to prosper in your life, you got to obey some laws. You don't obey those laws, you're going to struggle all your life. We got to get it right. Number eight, principles and laws protect the product. That's why God gave us laws, to protect us. They protect the product. I'll give you a verse. God says, you may say to yourself when you become wealthy and prosperous the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me he said be careful but remember the Lord because it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so fulfill and confirm his covenant that he made with your father even to this day he says look there are some laws that connected that I activated in your life that gave you the ability to produce wealth this ain't no lottery this ain't just happening because you're lucky. It is I who gave you the ability to produce wealth. I gave you the skills, the laws to produce wealth. Closing. Your goal, therefore, in life is not to be employed. But to be deployed and that's the secret to our coming out of a crisis it's not employment it's deployment in other words employment prepares you for deployment deployment activates your gifts it energizes your life it's the juice that make you get up in the morning. When a person deploys themselves, they don't wait for instructions. They find something that is so sweet to do that they initiate their own activity. 
deployment. Deployment is the use and the serving of your natural gift to the world. And everyone came at one or two. In other words, the future of your life is not in a job. It's in your seed, your gift. The Lord spoke to my heart. He said, I'm going to give everybody clear instructions this week of what to do for the next 10 months. You're coming out of this. You're going to come out of this. You're going to create your own environment, create your own resources. You're going to create your own revenue. There has to be a change of thinking. Stop being a victim of the news. Don't listen to the news anymore. You are not in that system. You're not controlled by that system. You go to your job, don't depend on it. Begin to ignite your gift. Inside of you is the wealthiest place in the world. It's that seed, unreleased, ungerminated. You've been stuck. It's just like you just go from, from your job to your house to your TV to your bed. There's got to be something else. And the problem is you don't own your life until after five. You got to get to the point where your gift becomes more important than your job. Go to your job, don't get me wrong, but don't trust it. Work on your gift. Work on your gift. The first thing God told man, work. Genesis 2.15. First command, work. What did I say? Work. The first command God gave man was work. Not marriage. Work. Not woman. Work. Work. Not a job. Work. <laughs> the word work is the word ergon. It means to become. 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 What in the world is God talking about? God put the man in the garden and says, become. What's he talking about? Well, it's like a seed with a tree trapped inside. Become. It's like a bird with flight trapped inside. Become! God calls that work. Books on potential. Two books I wrote. Five chapters just on work. Go read them. The secret to my life is become! Become! Work means not to do something. Become yourself. First command, become yourself. The last thing they encourage a Bahamian to do in my country is to become. They say, find a job. Get an education, they say, so you can get a job. So you can pay bills. 
and then die. They never say, discover who you are and become it. That's why it's so tough for you, Terry. It's tough for you because you decided, I want to become. And they got no room for you. Your products don't make no sense to them. They want you to work for somebody else. Work. Become. God will never demand what doesn't exist already. Become. There's something in you that you're supposed to become. This word, work, it's like a seed becoming a tree. It's like a, it's like a bird flying. Now I want to just caution you on this last part because I think it's very important. Uh, not all jobs are your work. That's why you hate Monday mornings. Because you go into a place that doesn't allow you to become. <laughs> You're stuck. You go to, it's like a bird in a cage. You know, a cage allows the bird to fly, you know. But only to a certain limit. They control you. They cage you. You're still a bird. And you can still fly a million miles, but you're in a cage. Your ability hasn't left. Your restrictions hold you back. And they say, this is as far as you go. Every Monday, every Tuesday, every Wednesday, every Thursday, Friday, this is as far as you go. And we have you in the cage until 5 p.m. And we let you out. That's why you dash home in a car. You feel so free, you call it off. You should call it out. Say out. In fact, I'm telling them, I'm getting out. <laughs> You ain't getting off. You out of the cage. What do you do? Go straight to the couch. Turn the TV on and do something dumb. You watch TV. It ends this week. No more TV. You got to activate that gift. You're going to tap into that hidden gift, that treasure. Not all jobs is your work. Write this one down. Your job is never your work. Your job is what they pay you to do. Your work is what you were born to do. They're different. Your job gives you a... prosperity I met Bill Gates one time I tell you I'll never forget that day Tacoma Washington what a day that was 
I met a man who used to work for IBM. He used to work for IBM. Did you know that? He used to work for IBM, Bill Gates. He worked in the programming department. He used to write the program, you know, DOS this and DOS that. He used to write them for y'all. And one day, he decided, I can simplify this. So he went home in his own house and worked out a formula to create these icons to make it not hard but soft. And he said, we'll put all the hard work behind the scene and just have a desktop and just click on icons. And the work is done behind. Instead of putting in the DOS this, DOS, DOS that, we just do it for you behind. We just let you click. He took it to the board of IBM and he says, I got an idea. They presented him to the people. He stood there before the board. He showed them everything. He said, this will work. The board says, impossible. Bill Gates. They said, it'll never work. But give it to us. We'll keep it. He said, no, 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 no. I don't want you to keep this. If you don't want it, I take it. And he resigned from IBM and went home to his garage and built the first software in his garage. IBM is still trying to recover. They could have owned Microsoft, but they didn't allow a man out of his cage. So he left the cage. And now every IBM computer has his software. I got a feeling some of you are going to come out of the cage in the next few weeks. God's going to give you something that no one's going to have. It's going to be birthed right here in your environment. And they won't believe you the first time. Hold on to your dream. Your work can become your job. What you want to do is go to a place where you actually work. You go to a place where you become. That's the goal. Some of you are in that place already. You go to a place where you actually use your gift. That's wonderful. That's great. You don't got to leave there. At least not now. Stay there. Develop your gift. But not all jobs are your work. But you can find your work in your job. Your work can be in your job. Some people have found it. As you leave here today, please be back here for session two. I'm going to give you the four principles of how to come out of your job, get into your work. And you don't got to depend on the systems no more. I found mine. I'm not a victim. We cannot be victims of the system. Be in the world, but not of the world. Be in the system, he says, but don't allow the system to make you a caged bird. As you go out of here today, ask God to show you your job and your work and to see the difference. Are you glad you came out today? Something good is going to happen to you. Something good is going to happen to you. Hallelujah. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.